So this was the next slide after this is where we left off last time. Um, ATP, adenosine triphosphate, because it has three phosphates, and it technically is a nucleic acid because it's a sugar, three phosphates, and a nitrogen base. And the idea is that ATP itself is not energy. What it is is an energy carrier. It carries energy from one reaction to another. So I gave you, uh, I showed you the little spinning turbine wheel yesterday and how that wheel would be like ATP, that it was just transferring the energy from the water moving to the light bulb so that it could light the light bulb. The light bulb required energy, the moving water provided energy, and ATP was just the link between the two. And so that's called energy coupling, taking the energy from one reaction and using it to fuel another one. The reason it's got so much energy is because of that third phosphate. That phosphate really is, even though it's represented real simply with, as just like a P, remember it's really PO4. And there's a bunch of negative oxygens there, opposite charges or like charges repel each other. And so what ends up happening is all those phosphates repel each other and so it's like a loaded spring, a high energy bond. And here's a, a diagram. Again, they're simplifying the phosphate into just the P with the circle around it. But the idea is that when that bond breaks off, it releases energy. All right, so this is where we left off. So ATP, what it really does is it passes its phosphate to other molecules, which is um, sort of an intermediate stage. And I'll show you a diagram of what that means. In general, the idea is that when the phosphate comes off, the energy from ATP is released. It now will take energy to put that phosphate back on. So it's just a cycle. You break the phosphate off, you put it back on. You break it off, you put it back on. Um, what puts it back on are reactions releasing energy, and then the reactions that require it break the phosphate off again. And so ATP is just literally passing the energy from one place to another. It's not a long-term energy storage molecule. You store energy long-term as fat. Plants store energy long-term as starch. You, you store energy short-term, like your glucose can be stored in your liver as glycogen. ATP is not an energy storage molecule. It doesn't hold on to energy for long periods of time. We're talking about regenerating it every second, regenerating lots and lots and lots of ATP. So it's sort of like playing hot potato. It's, it, you are just, if, AT, if you were ATP, you're just the one that catches the potato and passes it along. It stays with you in particular for a very, very short amount of time. So to build ATP, that's an endergonic reaction. It requires energy. So the way that our cells do it in the mitochondria through cell respiration, what they do is they take glucose, they break the glucose down into carbon dioxide and water, and the actual breakdown of the glucose into carbon dioxide and water is an energy releasing spontaneous exergonic reaction. The energy is re released very slowly and ATP carries that energy very, very quickly to other places where it is needed which is why mitochondria tend to be found in areas where a lot of energy is needed. Your muscles are full of mitochondria because energy is very, very um, important in muscle contraction. Your uh, sodium potassium pump would have a lot of a uh, mitochondria in the area where the pump is because ATP can't hold that energy for long periods of time. ATP is going to gen be generated in the area where it's needed. Photosynthesis makes ATP also. It's just not a final product. So you don't usually hear about ATP being made in photosynthesis. You think of photosynthesis, you think, oh yeah, carbon dioxide and water and the sunlight makes sugar. You never hear anything about ATP. But the bottom line is, in order for the sunlight to be captured by the plant, the sunlight hits the chlorophyll, ATP is made, and then ATP very quickly passes the energy over to build the glucose. So ATP, again, is just an energy carrier from the electrons uh, that were excited by the sunlight to the dark reactions where the sugar is actually generated. So both uh, cell respiration and photosynthesis both produce ATP. Just that cell respiration is more of a, we think of it as being the final thing. Um, in photosynthesis, it's, a, it's an intermediate thing. Here's just a little diagram showing the same thing. Energy being released by some reactions builds up ATP then the ATP breaks down and passes its energy along and it just continually gets built up and broken down as it just carries the energy back and forth. This one's a little complicated. You don't have to know this diagram. They're just trying to show you that even though this reaction is endergonic, it requires energy. But by breaking down ATP, 
we can make this reaction happen because breaking down ATP is exergonic, negative 7.3 kilocalories are, are released, only 3.4 are required for this reaction to go. So the overall delta G for this reaction, this would actually now be negative and it would be, this reaction could go because ATP, ATP was providing or releasing the energy to drive the reaction. This one you've seen before, the sodium potassium pump. ATP is what broke and caused the protein to change its shape so that it would um, let the sodiums out and then it would go back to its original shape and bring the potassiums in. And the last one is showing the work done by um, a motor protein, which is sort of like what you would see in muscle contraction. Okay, so that brings us to activation energy. The idea is this, our cells, well, let's put it this way. If everything tends to be spontaneously going towards a state of entropy, if everything tends to be going towards a state of equilibrium, then technically our complicated bodies with fats and proteins and sugars should be going in a direction to break down into amino acids and carbon dioxide and water and a bunch of simple things. We should, by all means, if spontaneous mint happens fast, we should all spontaneously combust. There should be no life on Earth. Everything should just reach equilibrium. But that doesn't happen. So the reason why a spontaneous reaction, even though that's the natural direction of the reaction, spontaneous has nothing to do with speed, is because there is energy involved in getting a reaction started. In order for reactants to become products, the reactants have to be pushed to what we call a transitional state. They have to be driven to this sort of unstable state that gets them ready to react. And the energy that's necessary to get them to react is called the energy of activation, or EA, activation energy. And this is what prevents every spontaneous reaction on the planet from occurring right now so that everything broke down. This is why only some reactions happen so, uh, at normal temperatures, for example. Some reactions, the activation energy barrier is broken by light. Light provides the energy, in some cases it's heat. If I heat up, you know, if I light that uh, match close to my gasoline, I can make the gasoline start burning. Once it burns, it's a very exergonic reaction. I can stand back and the reaction is going to go to completion. I gave you the idea of, of setting up a, a chain of dominoes. They're probably not going to fall. There needs to be some kind of activation energy. Maybe I blow on one domino. That one falls and now the reaction goes. But there was a kickstart that was necessary to get it started. Some reactions, like I said, are so... Um, have such a low activation energy, maybe certain reactants you have to keep them cold because just at room temperature they have enough activation, they have enough energy that they could go ahead and proceed through the reaction because remember they have energy on their own. There's energy of motion, you know the molecules are vibrating or moving depending if it's a solid liquid or gas, it contains a certain amount of energy to begin with. So this is called activation energy. Again in a lot of cases in the chemistry lab we use heat or stirring or shaking um, you know, things like that, that provide um, the activation energy just from the surroundings to get a reaction going. Another problem is, yes, we want to digest our food. Well, number one, we can't heat our stomach up to an oven to digest our food because that would damage our bodies. Number two, if we just made ourselves hot, everything would, every reaction would go. We want to be specific. We may want this to break down, but not something else. So we need a way of lowering activation energy, not for every reaction, but just for the specific reactions that we're interested in occurring. And here's a diagram of, of what I'm talking about. There's reactants here, and the reactants have a certain amount of energy. What letter do we use for free energy? G. Good, we use the letter G. So G, remember, is always a positive number. So this represents the G, the amount of energy contained, in the reactants. This represents G, the amount of energy contained in the products. This would be an example of an exergonic reaction because the amount of energy in the products is a lower number than the amount of energy that was contained in the reactants. In other words, this energy here, delta G, would be negative because it's being given away. The direction is away. It's giving away energy. It's releasing it. So maybe if this was 100, and this was 10, delta G would be what? We started with 100, we now have 10. 
So delta G would be 90. So 90 joules, let's just say, of energy were released in this reaction. The problem is the reaction needs a kickstart. The molecules have to be in the right state in order to, uh, for the reaction to proceed. Think of it this way, a rubber band. If I just leave a rubber band in the sun, here's a rubber band, I put it outside, I'll leave it in the sun for a while. If you come back, if you let it sit long enough, as soon as you try to stretch the rubber band, it breaks really easily because they get brittle. They, like, they lose their pliability. Let's say I take a second rubber band and I also put it outside next to the first one, but the second one I put between two nails. I have stressed this rubber band out. What I've actually done is I've lowered this. I've kind of lowered the kickstart for that rubber band to break. This one will eventually break, but because this one is already under a bunch of stress, it'll probably break more easily. Heating certain things makes the reaction happen more easily. So that's what we're talking about EA or the energy of activation. It's the kickstart to get a reaction going. Stressing the molecules is one way to lower that activation energy barrier.